This week, join me as I pursue one of the world's most intriguing mysteries, the legend of the lost tribes of Israel. The Bible's Book of Kings tells us that the northern kingdom of Israel was destroyed by a brutal Assyrian invasion in the 8th century BC, and more than land was lost. Ten of the twelve tribes of Israel would vanish into history and myth. But one of these lost tribes may have survived in the unlikeliest of places. Could ancient Jews have journeyed from the Middle East to South Africa? And could these African bloodlines reach back to King Solomon and before? To find out, I'm going to trace their journey. I'll brave an Israeli war zone, fly over the African bush, and explore a 3,000-year-old battlefield and ancient cities of stone. We're digging for the truth, and we're going to extremes to do it. They're a lot bigger than the scorpions in Utah. Oh, don't worry. They get much bigger. Look at the one at your foot. This is the Limpopo River, the northern border of South Africa. I've come to hear the story of a local group of people with astonishing ties to the story of the lost tribes of Israel, the Lemba. Today, they live only a few miles away from here, but this would have been the final challenge in an epic journey across deserts, oceans, and jungles. I'm Josh Bernstein, and my goal is to follow in their footsteps to determine if this fascinating story could possibly be true. Today, the Lemba are mainly concentrated in the shadow of the South Pansberg Mountains in the far north of South Africa. To the casual observer, they look and live much like any other traditional Southern African community. But if you scratch below the surface, there are some intriguing differences. Here I am in South Africa, and there are these men wearing skull caps and tali, shoulder wraps. And you would see this in any synagogue in America or Israel, but I never thought I'd see it here in South Africa. I want to find out how these people seem to have Jewish customs. Samuel Moeti is president of the Lemba Cultural Association. Pleasure. So, I'll be honest, I, I came into this village and the first word I heard was shalom. Yes. A Hebrew word. Yes. How is that possible? How is it that the, the Lemba is speaking Hebrew? The Lembas are the original Hebrews, and they were scattered, as you know, and they crossed into Africa. So they were scattered all over. So in South Africa, in many parts of South Africa, you find the Lembas who are actually Hebrews. Hebrews. So the Lembas claim to be descendants of ancient Israelites? Not claim. They are. They are. They are. Okay. We are the original African Hebrew. We are scattered all over. Can you give me a few examples of some of the Jews? Yes, we don't partake of pork. Okay. We don't mix milk with meat. It sounds to me like the Lemba have a, a unique culture surrounded by others who do not practice the same way. That is correct. We always believe that the Jewish people who live all over the world are our brothers because we come from the same root. Could it be that the Lemba are a lost tribe of Israel? To answer the question, I have to turn the clock back some 2,700 years to the time of the mighty Assyrians. Back then, Assyria was the greatest imperial power the world had ever seen. And it had set its expansionist sights on the northern kingdom of Israel. The northern kingdom, composed of ten tribal groups, was completely destroyed. Any surviving Israelites were enslaved and taken to Assyria what is now the nation-states of Iraq and Syria. Little is known about the fate of these lost tribes, but for 2,700 years, hope remained. Could the Israelites have regrouped? Could some have escaped their captors and fled? Could a group of wandering Israelites have survived the elements and continued on, faithful in some land far from home? Jerusalem. There's no place more associated with the Jewish people. But as I walk through its narrow streets, I can't help but appreciate how deeply connected the people of many faiths feel to this city, and how millions of people around the world have a connection to this place, including me. My father was born here, and I probably have ancestors who were here when the Assyrians broke up this land.
one of my relatives has told me that my grandparents are buried in this very graveyard on the Mount of Olives. I've never visited their graves before, but I've decided to try and find them. So after 10 minutes of wandering, I found them. So this is my grandmother. This is my grandfather. This is my great grandmother. My great grandfather. This actually means something to me. There's a connection for me that speaks to what the significance of heritage is. And for the Lemba, I understand why they might be interested in claiming some historical identity with Jerusalem. This is only two generations ago. For them, it's thousands of generations. People have claimed to have found lost tribes all over the world, from Siberia to Australia. Some of the first Europeans to land in the Americas assumed the natives were lost tribes and even tried to communicate with them in Hebrew. Historian Hillel Halkin has written a book about the lost tribes and thinks that they could still exist today. Hillel, why are you so passionate about the lost tribes of Israel? The lost tribe myth really is, uh, in, through Jewish eyes, among other things, a story of tough Jews living still uh, like the Jews' biblical ancestors, independent, warrior-like, fearless, all the things that Jews in the diaspora over the ages generally were not. Was this the first Jewish diaspora then? Yes. So we have some archaeological evidence besides Syrian inscriptions to show that these Israelites were deported to various parts of the Assyrian Empire. But after that, they disappear from history. What's the big deal with being a lost tribe? What is the attraction for these people to claim, I was one of the lost tribes of Israel? Well, the big deal, you have to understand, is not so much that people are claiming to be lost tribes, but the fact that the Christian and the Jewish world have been looking for hundreds or even of thousands of years for the lost tribe. It's the search for the lost tribes that is really the historically fascinating phenomenon. By now, the trail left by the lost tribes has gone cold. But perhaps the Lemba's oral history, handed down over the generations, can help us make a connection to the lost tribes of Israel. The Lemba's story goes like this. Thousands of years ago, they were forced out of Israel and settled in a place called Sena, which is believed to be the present-day Yemen. There, they lived as traders and craftsmen until war or natural disaster pushed them across the Red Sea and into Africa. Then began a slow migration south. Along the way, according to the Lemba, they built great stone cities. It's a claim that's fascinated archaeologists. Why? Because the ruins of ancient stone cities still exist in southern Africa today. It's also where I need to be exploring next. I had no idea how big this site was. I'm on the trail of an African tribe, the Lemba. They claim ancient Israelite ancestry and could just be one of the lost tribes of Israel. We are original Hebrew. Their oral traditions speak of a great journey through Africa and of the great stone cities that they left along the way. I'm on my way to see one now. The city of stone I'm going to is called Machema, and it's only a few kilometers down this road. Not many people know about this place. In fact, it's hidden on a huge cattle ranch, and I've had to get special permission to explore it. It's very rarely visited, even by archaeologists. I'm hoping it still has some clues to the Lemba story. Michael? Hello. Hello. How about in? To help me make sense of it, I've asked historian Dr. Magda LaRue to come with me to the site. She's been studying the Lemba for years and has just published a book on the similarities between their social customs and those of the Old Testament Israelites. So Magda, there are specific parallels between the, the religious practices of the Lemba today and the religious practices of ancient Israelites. Definitely. They've got remnants of an ancient type of Israelite religion. So in a way, wow. they conserve this very special yeah. ancient type of religion. It's like old religion. school religion. Yes. But how do they maintain that religious, that religious identity 
how did they keep it intact for so many years when there was this long journey from Israel down to South Africa? You see, that's, that's, the, the, that's a question. I think it's by means of the, the oral traditions. But they kept themselves separate from other groups. They lived with other peoples, moving with them, migrated southwards. Oh, that is one of their salient characteristics, that they, is that they keep up their culture. They just live it. Mm -hmm. you know, is this and, cultural uh, resilience the key to the Lemba's survival during their epic journey across 4,000 miles of land and sea? And could there still be any physical evidence here at Machima which supports the Lemba's claim to having made the journey? This once thriving settlement is now easy to miss, so we've asked one of the farm workers to take us to the site. Waiting for us at the top is archaeologist Richard Wade. He believes he's found some material evidence which links this site with both Yemen and Zimbabwe, two of the places the Lembas say they traveled through. Yeah, right. Come and have a look at these uh, amazing things here. There's a, a potter's weaving weight. I just potter's weaving weight. Saw this thing. It's uh, the form of a, a spinning jenny, and it's and uh, this, of course, is found uh, in Yemen. But uh, basically, this, apart from that, look what else. This is an amazing, I would say, not decoration, but inscription. I've seen this before. Mm -hmm. You make out some sort of a letter, followed by a dot, followed by another letter, followed by another sort of a letter, and a dot, and another letter. Or is it just decoration? Yeah. But the problem is we find this in Yemen. This? Yeah. You just found this, correct? Yeah, it was lying You're just sitting here? Yeah, there's another and few this, here. Just this potters. tells you what? Yeah. Well, this is a weaver. There was weaving done here. There was cotton grown. There was something with the trade. And the only people who do that are basically mentioned by the oral traditions of the Basena people or the Lemba. So and, this and, says yeah. the Lemba were not just living here. They were actually, they had a, a big enough community. They that they were, they were weaving. Yes. This is like a, a castle with almost a little kingdom, possibly. Richard believes the Lemba of Machima shared more than ancient technologies with the Israelites of Yemen. They shared the same culture. The inscription that's, bought, that's written into that wall is significant because it ties this place with other Lemba communities? I would say so. It seems both experts are convinced this place is definitely the work of ancient Lemba communities. The question that I'm wondering is that this is a significant amount of work. Is there anything physically, archaeologically, that was found here that connects the Lemba with other places that they claim to have traveled through? Yes, uh, there are amazing uh, collections of beads uh, which are found here and are found uh, in, in Zimbabwe, but it's a specific collection of beads. I'm not talking just about one or two of them. And these beads um, are directly related to Tarim and Sayut, uh, where the harbors are of the Sena people, originally coming through from Yemen. But Correct. nowhere else, nowhere else. So these beads, you just take a look at them real quick, reinforce the Lemba's claim Very much. that they did indeed travel from Israel into Yemen and then south uh, through Africa. This is actually the first physical proof I've gotten of the people here coming from someplace to the north. And the Lemba today claim this as their heritage. Then it is. The most intriguing feature at the Machima site is the remains of a mysterious conical tower, which still has archaeologists scratching their heads. But I'm not really clear what it was used for. Nobody really could tell you uh, unless you, they lived there. But is it, is it a lookout tower? No, it's too low for the rest. You would have your lookout tower higher there. So we have a very significant, well-made little conical tower, uh, which is very much the only one I've ever seen south of Zimbabwe. Really? Oh, yes. Zimbabwe's Great Enclosure has got uh, the large one. There's mm -hmm. quite a few there. There's a small one, but uh, this is not seen in South Africa. A Zimbabwe uh, connection is interesting because that's one of the places the Lemba say they traveled through. And these are the Lemba. Then this was built by the same people who built the one oh, in Zimbabwe? Definitely the same people. The same stonework is here, the same bead types, the same weaving technology. Richard lays and out some convincing the evidence that the Lemba did indeed build this place and could also have built the largest ancient stone city in sub-Saharan Africa, where I'm heading next. The ruins of Great Zimbabwe. It might be a bit of a long shot, but it's definitely worth a closer look. It's a really long drive, so I'm going to catch a ride with a local pilot. 
This will also give me a chance to see what the Lemba would have been up against on their long trek through the African bush. By the time I find out that this little plane isn't stable on windy days, it's too late. And we're off. Yeah, is that good or bad? Yeah, no, nah, it's not bad, but it's okay. <laughs> We've got it. <laughs> yeah. My pilot, Steve Scott, assures me we'll be fine. This is the Limpopo Riverbed here. Limpopo, and that's Zimbabwe over there. This is Zimbabwe right that's there. Zimbabwe. That's Zimbabwe. South Africa's right here. Yeah. Wow, that's just stunning. According to the Lemba, this was the final obstacle they faced on their journey from Israel to South Africa, the Limpopo River. It's the dry season now, but it's still full of crocodiles. Just one of the wild animals anyone trying to cross this land on foot has to steer clear of. And there would have been a lot more of them back when the Lemba say they made their journey. So we've just landed in Zimbabwe, and by just landed I mean we got here hours and hours ago, but we spent the better part of the afternoon getting our press credentials. It is not easy getting these at this time. We've been allowed, because our story is on Great Zimbabwe, which is a point of national pride. The whole country was named after this site I'm going to. Great Zimbabwe is in the south of the country, a five-hour drive from the capital, Harare. Oh, local crafts. I've come to buy everything. I wasn't sure what to expect. How much for the chest set? 120. 30,000. Keep in mind that one dollar US is currently 6,000. This country used to be one of the most successful in Africa with a huge tourism industry. But government policy has driven most tourists Thank you away. Very much. Bye. Thank you. Life's not much different in Masvengo, the town nearest to Great Zimbabwe, the ancient city the Lemba claimed to have built. And tomorrow I'll find out if their claim is true. And I'll get my hands dirty learning how they built it. All right. I have made fire. I'm on the trail of an amazing group of people who now live in southern Africa, but claim to have made an epic journey to get there. So the Lembas claim to be descendants of ancient Israelites? Not they are. Oh. they are. They are. I've learned that 2,700 years ago, the Assyrian Empire scattered the population of the northern kingdom of ancient Israel creating the so-called Lost Tribes of Israel. The Lemba story is that they settled in Yemen before crossing the Red Sea and traveling inland through Africa, where they built great cities of stone. I've seen evidence of one they built near their current home in South Africa. Now, I'm backtracking their journey to explore a structure they claim to have built centuries earlier, and which could be their greatest legacy, Great Zimbabwe. It's been a long journey getting here, but I couldn't miss the chance of seeing the sunrise. And as more of this place appears out of the dawn mist, I begin to get an idea of its scale. The site covers an area of four square miles, the largest ancient stone city in sub-Saharan Africa. As I walk around, I can imagine this place as a bustling community, the hub of an empire that ruled over a vast area of southern Africa, a center for trade from far and wide. The Zimbabweans are very proud of it, and who can blame them? I'm here to meet Dr. Edward Matenga, the site's curator and an expert on the history of Great Zimbabwe. Wow. So this whole area was a city that ruled the kingdom. Yes, the first buildings were laid on the hill, and then it extended uh, into the valley. You know, I saw parts of those buildings coming up here, but I had no idea how big this site was. In the background, we've got the biggest building, which is the, the Great Enclosure. The Great Enclosure is that big circular one? Yes. Huh. Wow. What was this place for? This is the Great Enclosure. Yeah? It was built for the uh, paramount wife of the king. For the wife, the first wife of the king. Yes. So Edward tells wives. me that the great enclosure was the last structure at the site to be built, around 1400 A.D. 
What I really want to see is the conical tower that Richard Wade says oh, is the same as the one we saw at Machima. It's called the conical tower. Conical tower. What was it used for? Ah, uh, your guess is as good as mine. It wasn't used for, for anything other than being a sort of a ceremonial. A ceremonial. Really? There's no... Is there an entrance? A door? No. So I don't get it. It's just a big cone of rock. Yeah, it's all sort of... A, it's pegged in, in stones and there's no entrance. As Richard Wade told me, no one knows for sure what these towers were for. But the fact that both Machima and Great Zimbabwe have them supports the claim that the same people were involved in building both sites. Which brings me to the big question. Edward, who built this place? Uh, this site was built by ancestral Shona communities. The Shona today are the predominant inhabitants of uh, Zimbabwe. They are a segment of the Bandu. Edward Bandu believes Bandu that it's his ancestors, the Shona, who built this place. So where does that leave the Lemba? So this entire community was built by the Shona? Yes, sir, this is the, the only site, as I told you, there are about 300 uh, sites. Historian Magda LaRue told me that the Lemba lived and worked alongside other communities while maintaining their own identity and culture. So it's still possible that the Lemba were involved in this place's construction. And since this type of architecture was unique in Africa at the time, Maybe it was the Lemba who provided the equally unique stonework seen here at Great Zimbabwe. Whoever built this place, it was a real feat of engineering. These walls are solid granite, not soft sandstone. You said that there were 15 million stones put in this wall? Yes, uh, this was a, a big job. How could they have found or quarried so much stone? I can show you one of the quarries, which is not very far from me. From me this one. Edward has taken me onto one of the hills around Great Zimbabwe. They're made of granite sheets, smooth and slightly curved like an onion skin. What are these guys doing? They are preparing the rock for the building the stone walls. Huh? As you can see, they have to choose a suitable site. This is characteristic of the, the rock, that it breaks in parallel sheets, and that's where you make your fire. So you build a fire on top of the rock, and then it, what, cracks? It cracks. Ah. Yeah. And this is the traditional technique? That's the, what, how they were doing it in the in Zimbabwean times. So we'll make a fire. I just need a little bit more straw to start that fire. It's hard to believe that just by lighting a fire on this huge rock, you can split it. Good spin. Good spin. They say the process should take several hours. We'll see. Gotta keep stoking the fire! Fire! That looks good. That's actually right on top of the fracture. So that's good, right? Yeah. So once it starts cracking, we just kind of watch it go all the way along the way. Yes. And then you have to push the fire, this side, and move. I heard that. Oh, I heard that. You hear that? Yeah. This pop explosion. The rock's starting to crack. You can hear it before it starts to go. There's the crinkling, or the crackling of the fire, and then below it, you can hear the rocks kind of going ding, 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 ding. It's going down there, so it just went all the way down there. You can't see it, we have to move the fire, but it looks like it runs all the way, all the way down here to the end. Hey, that's a little hot. You don't have any eyebrows left. Yeah. Now, I see we're using metal tools. Would the Shona have had metal tools? No, except for uh, 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 iron hammers. Iron, so they had iron. Yeah, iron hammers. But the hammers were probably used to break the rock. Yes. More than... Kind of they would use the, the wooden racks. Wooden racks to yeah. move everything. To move everything. And then the iron hammers would be used to break the rock later. Break the rocks and then trim them. That's it. A perfect one. Again. That's a perfect one? Yeah. I made this one. The building blocks uh, for the great enclosure were basically made in this way. So all of the building blocks... For, for the, the stonework that we saw, yes, is made this way. M I can it's see now where the building blocks for Great Zimbabwe came from, but I still haven't gotten to the bottom of exactly who built it. Were the Lemba involved, as they claim? Uh, they are an African people, just like uh, the Shona. They are Shona speaking today. So it's possible their claim may hold some some weight that they were here. 
they are certainly they, they were certainly here, but yeah. whether they build the the, the, the stone walls or not, yeah. it's uh, it's very difficult to substantiate. As I as I said, I mean the 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 the, the evidence that is available at the moment in terms of oral testimonies is vague. Okay. Okay. Well, but at least there's a possibility. Great Zimbabwe certainly fits the description of the great stone cities the Lemba claimed to have built. And Edward confirms that the Lemba were definitely here. Even today, they have communities not far from here. Amazingly, the Lemba who live here in Zimbabwe, just like those in South Africa, really do believe they're Hebrews. And the cities of stone they claim to have built do seem to support their oral traditions. But does this make them a lost tribe of Israel? Did the Lemba, like the lost tribes, actually leave Israel in the 8th century BC? Are the Lemba truly a lost tribe of Israel? If so, they would have also been victims of the Assyrian invasion of the Northern Kingdom. I've just learned there's some archaeological evidence found in the same Israelite cities which fell to the Assyrians all those years ago, and which could finally put this question to rest. I want to see this site for myself, so I'm going back to the Holy Land. I'm now in Israel, just a few miles north of Jerusalem. I'm on my way to Shomron, which in English is Samaria. During the time of the Northern Kingdom, Samaria was its capital, and there was a lot of fighting going on. 2,700 years later, there still is. This place is a war zone right in the middle of the West Bank or occupied territories. So I've had to take a few extra precautions to get there. This is Iskak. Shalom. And this is my armored truck to get there. It's two inches of solid steel. Yes. Of solid course. steel. And the windows? Also two inches. Two inches bulletproof glass. I'm hoping we won't need to use it, but again, we've taken every precaution because this place is not secure. Yalla. We're trying to get to an archaeological site called Sebastia. It may hold vital clues about how the Lemba's epic journey began. But it's on the other right. side of a heavily guarded checkpoint. <laughs> Will we be able to get in? I'm on the trail of the Lemba, an African tribe who now live in South Africa, but claim to have made an epic 4,000-mile journey from Israel to get there. I've heard they were involved in the building of Great Zimbabwe, as well as similar stone cities elsewhere in South Africa. Now, I've returned to Israel, where they claim to have originated, to pick up their trail. If the Lemba are a lost tribe, they must have been present when ancient Israel split into the southern kingdom of Judah and the northern kingdom of Israel. This was also the time that their neighbor, the mighty Assyrian Empire, was building in strength. For a while, the Assyrians tolerated the northern kingdom, but the ten northern tribes were living on borrowed time. I've returned to Israel to visit the remains of one of the Northern Kingdom cities. Trouble is, just as it was 2,700 years ago, this area is still a war zone. I want to show you where we're headed. On the top of this hill is Sebastia. There's an archaeological site there that's important to understand the Lemba's story. The problem is, Sebastia is in the occupied territory. And there's a military checkpoint just over here. So the big question is, will they let us through so that I can gain access to the site? But this isn't your average road trip. We've had to rent an armored truck to take us deep into a war zone. Itzhak, my driver, is an Israeli settler. And for him, this level of danger is just everyday life. Itzhak, you live in a settlement? Yes, of course. How long have you lived there? 25 years. Is Should I be concerned that I'm going into the occupied territory? I cannot promise you that uh, nothing not uh, happened to you. Right. Can't promise. No promises. I could get shot. Everybody can shot. Everyone gets shot. Where I come from, everyone doesn't get shot. <laughs> everyone goes to the mall, watches TV, and gets back. The Israeli settlers live alongside Palestinian communities, but only with massive military protection. It definitely looks. Uh, I think what that? Look at the tanks. Twenty-seven hundred years ago, it was just as tense. That's when the Assyrian Empire bore down on what is now the West Bank. The Bible tells us what happened in the second book of Kings, chapter 17. Then the king of Assyria came up throughout all the land. 
and went up to Samaria and besieged it three years. In the ninth year of Hoshea, the king of Assyria took Samaria and carried Israel away. This is where they remained in exile. We're now approaching the checkpoint. We've been working on gaining access to the Sebastia site for weeks, and yesterday we finally got permission. But we were warned that if there's even the smallest bit of trouble in the occupied territories, we won't be allowed to the site. See those tanks? <laughs> this doorway is like a thousand pounds. So I, I want to go to Sebastia, the archaeological site. Archaeological site. Yeah, is there an officer? We have with, with the History Channel. You have Shalom Likanes Khan. And yesh, yesh, uh, how do you say permission? You know the word permission? Yesh Lanu permission. It's my horrible Hebrew, you know, I forget all. When he has a rifle, you tend to forget all the words. It's dangerous? Really? Here's what's going on. This uh, producer, an associate producer, talking to the guard. He refuses to let us in. We've been working on this for weeks, and yesterday it was fine. But they're saying that today, because of a recent uprising, they won't let us through the security gate. Despite our best efforts, Sebastia is a bust. Fortunately, I have a backup plan. There's another ancient city which fell to the Assyrians, a place where the lost tribe story may have begun and where the Lemba might have started their journey. It's called Megiddo, but you might know it by its other name, Armageddon. Megiddo appears in the Old Testament, and in the New Testament, the same location is called Armageddon, the place where the book of Revelation claims the final battle between good and evil will be fought. Today, it's an important archaeological site, but in the 8th century BC, this place was a battlefield. Trade items that the Egyptians were interested in. Archaeologist Israel Finkelstein is director of the Megiddo expedition and an expert on the ancient kingdoms of Israel. He's agreed to tell me more about this site and the city of Megiddo's extensive influence. Well, it was quite a big state. It was the most, uh, the prosperous, the most prosperous state in the Levant at that time. They reached all the way, I mean, you can hear about them from the information given to you by the, their neighbors. So the king of Moab is complaining, well, the king of Damascus is complaining that they took territory from him in the north. The king of Assyria, the great king of Assyria, is saying that King Ahab of the northern kingdom came to fight, you know, at Karkar against uh, the Assyrians with uh, a huge uh, army of chariots. So according to all these, they were very powerful in the 9th century. So I at this location, these people, they said there was about a thousand people living here. Something like that. They were able to be, become significantly powerful so that the Assyrians, who were a powerhouse of their own, actually respected them. Yes, if, no doubt about that. In the beginning, before Assyria became, so to speak, a devouring empire, in the beginning there was kind of some sort of relationship between Assyria and the Northern Kingdom, and at a certain period of time, even the Northern Kingdom was an ally of the Assyrians. I mean, of course, a weaker ally, but still an ally under the sphere of influence of Assyria. But then, in the second half of the 8th century, things changed, and the Assyrians were interested in simply ruling over those territories and taking them over. Eventually, the Assyrians' patience ran out, and they would no longer tolerate challenges to their power. They had set their sights on empire. The Assyrians' advance was swift and decisive as city after city of the Israeli kingdom fell to their mighty army. The Bible called Assyria a land bathed in blood. Israel Finkelstein believes that when the Assyrians conquered this land, they wiped out all the leadership of the tribes of Israel. The population was either killed or assimilated into other parts of the Assyrian Empire. He doesn't believe they could be found today. 
this, you were saying, was the building that the Assyrians built once they took over this area. Yes, this is one of the two palaces that the Assyrians built here. What happens then to the, the rulers of the northern kingdom when the Assyrians come in and take over? The rulers were deported. We don't know whether all of them, part of them, most of them, many of them. We don't have this kind of information, neither from the Bible nor from the Assyrian text, and of course not from archaeology. Archaeology cannot speak about a person. But most of this population probably assimilated in Mesopotamia. So the people who are on a quest to, to find the lost tribes and to recover them and bring them back to Israel, they would only have to travel as far as Mesopotamia? I don't think that you can travel anywhere and look for the lost tribes. I mean, this, uh, I, I make a distinction between what we know from archaeology, history, and so on, and all sorts of popular ideas of going this way or that way and finding a lost tribe. There's no need whatsoever to go around the world, in my opinion, and look for lost tribes. Fair enough. But the archaeology here says that the people did leave. The people did leave, the people did die, the people, some of them were deported to Mesopotamia, some of them continue to live here. Okay. Well, that's valuable. And seeing this certainly brings to me a sense of what community existed in the Northern Kingdoms. To me too. Israel Finkelstein tells me that Assyrian rule lasted for almost 100 years, that they went to great lengths to split up ethnic groups and cultures. So if it's true that none of the 10 lost tribes could have possibly survived intact, where does this leave the Lemba? I've certainly seen some evidence that they did make at least part of the journey they claim, but I can't prove a link to the Holy Land. There seems to be no trace of them left here at all. But there's one piece of evidence the Assyrians couldn't destroy. If the Lemba's claim is true, the proof should be in their blood. It's now possible to trace the Lemba's ancestry through their DNA. And that's just what scientists in South Africa have done. I'm going back to the Lemba's current homeland to find out the truth behind this fascinating mystery. Doctor? I've returned to South Africa, the current home of the Lemba, an African tribe who call themselves original Hebrews. We've traced the journey they claim to have made across the whole continent of Africa. I've seen evidence the Lemba were traders and craftsmen, and that they helped build great stone cities in Zimbabwe and South Africa. But it's proven very difficult to locate any evidence linking the Lemba to the famous lost tribes of Israel. But I'm not finished yet. In fact, there could still be solid proof behind their claim to Jewish ancestry. That's why I've come to Johannesburg. The scientists here at the National Health Laboratory Services have screened the genetic profiles of the Lemba and their neighboring tribes, the Venda and the Bantu. They've come up with some revealing conclusions. I heard of the Lemba many years ago. Dr. Trevor um, Jenkins has been the lead geneticist in the study of the Lemba for the last 20 years. And I didn't really have much interest in pursuing their actual identity until a friend who had been studying the Lemba had detected some Jewish influences in the music of the Lemba. So their, their music actually differs from the people around them. And that brought you in to study the genetics? Yes. So the genetic data doesn't say that the Lemba are Jewish as much as it says they have Semitic origins. Yes, that's how we put it. What we were saying was that there's a non-African contribution to the gene pool of the Lemba, uh, which is not evident in the peoples amongst whom they live in that part of the world. You mentioned non-African influences. If someone didn't have genetic data or the testing available, how could you determine if one group is Jewish or not? I distrust relying on morphological features to categorize populations. So someone couldn't say, oh, he looks Jewish, she looks Jewish, he's not Jewish, she's not Jewish. That wouldn't have any bearing on the issue of Semitic origins. I don't think so. The Lemba... Dr. Jenkins so believes Lemba. DNA Looking always trumps Lemba. appearances, and the Lemba's claim to Jewish ancestry may indeed have some genetic support. Not only is their DNA very different from their neighbors, but according to his colleague, Dr. Hemla Sudyal, it may have a non-African, even Hi. Jewish, connection. I'm Josh. Good to see you. Yes. Take a seat, ah, sorry. Great. I have gloves on, so okay. I prefer not to shake your hand. That's fine. Thank you. 
So I've come back to Johannesburg for more information about the Lemba, and I'm curious if you could tell me about the research you're doing. Yes, this is the very interesting thing, that the South African Lemba harbor a particular Y chromosome pattern or lineage that's common in people who identify as the Kohanim or the Jewish priests. Okay. In the Jewish tradition, the Kohanim are part of the priestly caste. Amazingly, scientists have isolated a strand of DNA that's strongly associated with the Kohanim. It's called the Kohen modal haplotype, and it's almost exclusive to Jews who claim the priestly heritage. Almost exclusive. The Kohen modal haplotype has been found among the priestly caste of the Lemba. The observation that the Kohen pattern was commonest in that one particular group is something that, that begs exploration. This link supports the Lemba's oral history and the archaeological clues we've seen in the places they say they lived. Hardcore time. But Himmler is quick to point out the limitations of genetic science. Now, in terms of whether the Lemba are Jewish because they have the Cohen modal haplotype or not, is something that science cannot address. Because cultural identity is a social construct. Mm -hmm. No genetic data is going to tell you that you are Jewish or that you are Hindu or that you are Christian or any religious domination. Himmler tells me that the presence of the Kohen modal haplotype can't tell us anything about the Lemba's religion. Yet just as remarkably, it can tell us where their ancestors came from. And it's not in Africa. There is this interesting genetic information showing us that some of the original founders did come from other parts of the world other than Africa. From our data, I would put my money on saying it's the Middle East. Himmler is convinced that Lemba ancestors did indeed come from the Middle East. I'm excited to get back to the Lemba to see what they make of this. And I've got the perfect opportunity. It's the Lemba's annual festival, and I've been invited. It's hard to believe that these people, who to the casual observer look just like the other African communities they live among, actually do have DNA passed down from Middle Eastern forefathers. This proves that when it comes to race, looks really can be deceiving. This annual festival is a chance for the oral history and traditional songs of the Lemba to be passed on to the next generation. This song tells the story of the Lemba's journey all the way from Israel to South Africa. Having traced this journey, I'm eager to hear what Samuel Moetti thinks about the DNA evidence. So the genetic testing actually proved to the doubters what you and your forefathers have been saying for generations. That must be exciting news. It is. I'll be honest, I hadn't heard of the Lemba. I knew very little about the people. But having spent time making the journey from Jerusalem down through Zimbabwe, having spent time here at this festival, seeing what your people are all about, I can only sum it up in one word, and that's shalom. Shalom. We've seen how science has backed up the claims of the Lemba in the face of years of doubt and prejudice. The archaeological clues, the DNA evidence, and the Lemba's own oral history add up to a very convincing argument. One of the most challenging aspects to doing this journey and seeing what it was like for the Lemba to go from the northern parts of Israel down into South Africa is that there's very little archaeological evidence on the ground that says definitively this is what the Lemba did. So this is why I think the genetic component is so compelling because it's hard to fake the DNA. It's in your blood. It reminds me that first impressions can often be misleading. It was hard to believe that a tribe of black Africans could be the descendants of ancient Israelites. But that's exactly what they appear to be. Brothers and sisters, they are there. We are not lost. We are scattered. We are original Hebrews. 